people with liberty and justice for all. Okay, I need a motion to adopt the agenda. Moved by Brown, supported by Romano. Please vote. <clears throat> motion passes 10 to zero. I'm gonna make a motion to approve the June 17th and August 12th, 2019 minutes. Is there a motion? Moved by Sauger, supported by Kraft. Please vote. <coughs> Motion passes 10 to zero. Public participation, does anyone wish to be heard? Any, please step forward, state your name for the record. Hi, my name is Gabriel Weikert. Um, am I good to speak now? Um, okay. Um, my name is Gabriel Weikert. I am a 10th grader who attends um, Eisenhower High School in the Utica Center for Math, Science, and Technology. I would like to um, reach out to the representatives here today about a concern I have about mental health. I believe that there is a mental health problem in our society due to the fact that there is a Center for Disease Control report that says that 14% of students have considered ending their lives at one point. That is a very um, scary fact. And so right now, um, what I have done is I have written a bill, a piece of legislation that would require schools in the state of Michigan to reallocate five minutes of their day towards positive mental health education. And if you are interested in the bill, you can um, speak with me for more details. But um, essentially, there are very simplistic exercises such as breathing techniques and um, simple meditation that could help improve the mental health of students exponentially when practiced for only five minutes. And so today I would like to ask the representatives here to join me in putting my foot down in the fight against mental poor mental health. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone else wish to be heard? Hi, please step forward. State your name and city or township that you're from, please. Mike Moreau, Sterling Heights. Go ahead. Mr. Chairman, committee members, good afternoon. Our roads in Macomb County are in terrible shape. Mr. Hackle recently stated that Macomb County could spend the entire state budget for roads in Macomb and it would still not be enough. One of the core issues is proper allocation of funding for roads across the state. Increasing taxes for road funding will not help Macomb County until the state formula is changed to more accurately address actual need. Public Act 51 passed in 1951 is archaic and does not allocate funds appropriately. Wayne, Oakland, and Macomb counties are severely shortchanged, while outstate low population counties get an inordinate amount of funding. Macomb, Oakland, and Wayne counties account for 38 percent of all vehicle registrations, yet receive nowhere near a representative amount of funding. Increasing taxes in any form will only perpetuate the ineffective distribution of state road funding. As we know, Public Act 51 allocates funding on a per mile basis. A county in the UP with two lanes and roads and minimal related infrastructure gets the same per mile funding as Macomb, Wayne, or Oakland counties with six and eight lane roads and related infrastructure such as on and off ramps and bridges. The reality of the public climate is, and will continue to be, that Public Act 51 will not be changed. Road funding is of great benefit to outstate counties in terms of generous funding for good roads, as well as good jobs for county road workers, their families, and businesses profiting from road maintenance activities. It's time to reprioritize road funding to the counties that pay an outsized amount and let the less populated counties receive an amount more reflective of their needs and contributions to state road funding. Senator Pete Lacido introduced Senate Bill 27 
to amend Public Act 51 to allocate revenue from vehicle registration fees to the County Road Commission in which the registrant resides. He also introduced St Senate Bill 28 to amend Public Act 51 to require fuel tax to be dispersed in the county where pumped. These bills have languished in the Senate since proposed on January the 16th, 2019. The reason these bills will never get a proper hearing is because they must be put on the agenda by the Senate leader. House and Senate leaders have historically been from outstate counties. Altering the cash cow of Public Act 51 would be political suicide for these outstate leaders. Forcing action on state uh, Senate bills 27 and 28 by initiating a ballot proposal would bypass the politics of the outstate counties. A ballot initiative is bipartisan. Both Republicans and Democrats alike use our roads. Both Democrats and Republicans suffer the same ineffective and outmoded formula for fund allocation. I urge Mr. Hackle and the Board of Commissioners to work together to pursue initiating a ballot proposal, a ballot proposal, to amend the archaic Public Act 51 to Senate Bills 27 and 28. Funding priorities in general also need to be addressed. How much money we have to spend and how we spend it cannot be separated. From the taxpayer's perspective, it appears that new money, that is taxes, is pursued almost exclusively as a remedy for solving problems. To drive home the seriousness of the condition of our roads, former Governor Snyder published a picture of a school bus with a huge chunk of concrete stuck in the windshield. What budget item could possibly be more critical than eliminating conditions such as this. We hear about the lack of funding for roads, yet the Michigan state budget increased from $42 billion in 2008 to $58 billion in 2019. Where did the $16 billion go? If roads are such a high priority, as shown by Governor Snyder, why wasn't the $16 billion allocated to roads? Sir, Again, you where have, did the $16 sir, you have 30 billion, seconds, okay? I'll talk faster, thank you. Obviously not to the roads based on Governor Whitmer's plan to increase gas taxes. Looking to the future, we in Macomb County have concerns. Oakland County has received a new executive who is a strong advocate of regional mass transit. There will no doubt be a renewed and vigorous push, vigorous push, push for regional mass transit. Past RTA proposals typically have advocated for $4.5 billion in new funding. Commissioners, please stand strong with Mr. Hackle when he represents the taxpayers. Sir, your payers. time has expired. Please wrap up. One more sentence. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you for the time. Please stand strong with Mr. Hackle when he represents the taxpayers of Macomb who have resoundingly made it clear we need money for roads. We do not need to enter binding expensive agreements with other counties, other counties where our authority is diluted. Thank you. Thank you very much. Does, does anyone else wish to be heard? Anyone else? Seeing none, we'll close the first hearing of the public. Presentations, we've got the Macomb County Legislation Delegation Town Hall Session, and I'm gonna open it up by turning over to Chair Smith. Thank you, Chair. Um, once again, I'm Bob Smith. I'm the Chairman of the Board of County Commissioners. My district is District 12, which encompasses pretty much all of Clinton Township. I'd like to welcome all of you here, um, all of you, and thank you for taking the time to come here to what has turned out to be an annual event, our second annual Macomb Legislative Delegation Town Hall, as we like to call it, a mouthful. Um, so everyone knows our meeting is being recorded. Um, it'll be posted online. This is done so that we can provide the public the access of the information so everybody will have an opportunity, whether they were here or not, to see what all of you had to say. And we look forward to hearing what each of you has to say. So the most important part of my welcome speech, besides talking about Commissioner Kleinfeld, who chairs our Finance, Audit, and Budget Committee, who will take this over in a minute, and she's gonna moderate the, uh, the speakers. But I'd just like to request, since we have so many people here, that if you have something uh, on your agenda to talk about, and someone has uh, sp spoken of it right before you got up, and they've, they've said everything you wanna say, please acknowledge that, and, and maybe head to another topic that uh, would be interesting to us as well. Um, so that way we can get through everybody and hear as many uh, points as you have to, to offer us because we really look forward to hearing from you. So again, thank you to all of you. We appreciate it. We hope this is going to be a continuing year-to-year -year tra tradition. And Commissioner Kleinfeld, if you'd like to get us started. Yes, thank you. And by the way, um, that, 
that applies to commissioners as well. I don't want to get into a deep philosophical conversation with any one particular representative. No, I'm not talking to you, Andre. I'm talking to Leon over there. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, so I'm going to uh, I'm going to introduce individuals to come up first to introduce themselves, maybe talk about um, the, the communities they represent and the committees that they currently serve, initiatives that they're involved with, um, um, and how they affect Macomb County, um, rather briefly, so that we don't keep all of you for a very long time. So we're going to start out with uh, Senator Debbie Stabenow's office. We have with us Amanda York. Hello, Amanda. Hello. Thank you so much for allowing me to come here today on behalf of Senator Stabenow. I was with her today and she sends her regrets that she couldn't be here. She uh, did board a plane and head back to Washington. She's here every weekend um, and we, you know, run her ragged on the weekend. So um, I do want to uh, just a brief information. I know you were interested in the committee assignment. She's the ranking member of the Senate Agriculture, Nutrition and Forest Forestry Committee. Um, she's also on the Budget Committee, the Energy and Natural Resources committee and the finance uh, committee where she is the ranking member of the subcommittee on health care which is her passion health care um, so just earlier this year Senator Stabenow uh, introduced bipartisan legislation um, to expand funding for the excellence in community health uh, bill that she in, that she wrote um, this is, you know, this expands funding for community health and addiction services in local communities. So we're hoping that um, that, that funding will, will come here and into Macomb County as well. Um, she also introduced legislation, uh, Medicare at 50. Um, this is something that uh, she hears when she's around the state here in Macomb County that a lot of people are, you know, they're working a few extra years because they, they're waiting to get on to Medicare and they need that insurance. So, so she thinks this is is a realistic you know bipartisan effort to uh, to allow folks to join Medicare at 50 uh, kind of going along with that her other you know uh, Medicare is not allowed currently to negotiate prices for prescription drugs like the VA is and that's just a tremendous cost to our health care system so we're also working on on that um, just briefly her other passion are Great Lakes and she recently um, she released, recently introduced legislation to renew and expand her GLRI bill. Um, this would actually uh, increase funding to $475 million in a few, in, within five years. Um, I just wanted, I was just looking up some numbers already because of GLRI, $156 million has come into Southeast Michigan in 108 projects. So we're really um, happy and excited about that. So I just wanted to leave you with, um, you know, I, I'm her regional manager here in Macomb County. I also uh, represent her in Western Wayne County in the Downriver communities. My office is in Detroit. Um, I think most of you know how to get a hold of me, but if, if the Senator can be helpful to you in any way, please let me know. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. Okay, Senator Peters had somebody coming. He had uh, uh, Kevin Rick come in, most of you know who he is, and he's not uh, feeling well, so he's not able to attend. Um, I have pending on, Sen on Congressman Levin. Does he have a spokesperson <coughs> here today? Okay. Okay, so um, Paul Mitchell, um, I also have pending. Does Paul Mitchell have a spokesperson here? I know that uh, Tony Forlini will be coming in late. Is there anyone else here? Hi, come on forward. I don't have your name down, so you'll have to introduce yourself. Yes, my name is Hillary Dubay. I serve as Congressman Paul Mitchell's, one of his community outreach coordinators. Um, Mr. Forlini is on his way. Um, he will be able to give a full address in regards to the Congressman and all of his activities in DC. So he is about 30 minutes away, and we should expect Mr. Forlini at that time. I'll keep him on my list. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you. Okay, so we have, I know Senator Lacido's here. Usually when he's in a room, everybody knows he's here. Come on up, Senator Lacido. Thank you for the warm introduction. Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate that, Madam Commissioner. It was so, so gracious. Well, first of all, I'm Pete Lacido, and for those that don't know me, I'm delighted to be here, and I welcome the opportunity of always speaking to my commissioners who does such a great job 
taking care of their constituents in their districts as we do in the legislature. Let me first off begin by stating that I am the senator for the 8th district, one of the finest districts, I think. It uh, serves Bruce Township, Romeo, it also has Shelby, Washington, Utica, Ray, Lennox, Chesterfield, Mount Clemens, Harrison, St. Clair Shores, as well as um, New Haven, and it covers quite an extensive amount of the district of this, of this lovely county of Macomb. Let me first off by begin by stating I am very proud and privileged to be a senator, but more importantly, part of the legislative team here in Macomb County. We all, and I'm speaking for every one of us, welcome the opportunity to speak to each and every one of you. We all have coffee hours or some district hours, we call it. Please reach out to us when you think there's a need for something in your districts. Let me get right to it by saying this. I want to have a coalition with my county commissioners, and I too believe that my colleagues in the legislature do. I want my executive to have a coalition with his legislators, not to bash one another, and not to feel offended by the road funding the way it's been for 70 years almost. I echo the sentiments of the speaker that spoke, and the reason I do that is because Senate Bill 28 and 29, which you want to speak about legislation, there's a real meaning dialogue that needs to be had. Our governor, my governor, came out and indicated unequivocally that she did not want to fund through Public Act 51. Isn't that an oddity after all these years? It's unequitable. It is also non, it's, it's disingenuous to us, the taxpayers of this county. And you know what? Those individuals that sit on this commission that once served in the legislature, I can tell you first and foremost that I'd love to give you a full depth and scope of how it's unequitable. We are almost 40% of the vehicles that are registered in this state in the Tri-County. When you take Kent and Genesee, you're over 50%. Yet we get 38 cents on a dollar. Forget it. If my team of county commissioners and my executive don't help, it'll never get changed. It hasn't in 70 years. Marilyn Lane, who works as, as a once a legislator, a former mayor, at the end of the day, she was six years as a vice chair of the Transportation Committee and knows too well how it all works. There's always somebody from up north that'll stop that Public Act 51 bill for the sake of money. So I won't sugarcoat this in any way, shape, or form. We need a ballot initiative. Otherwise, you are all stuck with a millage in your towns to raise new revenue. There is another way, just tax the voters, but we're not into the mood for that today just like the governor wanted to do at 45 cents. It wasn't even brought up by her own party. But we're not here to bash one another. We're here to come up with solutions, options, alternatives. And that is where I come in and said, this Senate bill and this, uh, these Senate bills are a pair of bills, and I'm only gonna speak to these bills today. I've got other initiatives if you wanna talk about criminal justice reforms, civil asset forfeiture, and all the other nonsense that I've had to come up with to reform things that are so obvious to all of us. But that's okay. Today I want to speak strictly with your help and that of my executive, our executive. Do the right thing. Educate the voters in regards to Public Act 51, how we are cheated. There's an opinion in the September 3rd uh, Detroit News. I want you all to take a look at it. Go online. It's a better plan for roads. It was written by a Macomb County Senator, myself. It talked about how we fixed this problem. We have it very bad here. To pick up new businesses or to pick up new community members, we first gotta make ourselves look right, not bicker about why the legislators not doing their job. They should be up there getting us money and take, instead of taking photo selfies and everything. Well, damn it, I'm tired and I hope you are. Bring it to the ballot. Let the people change Public Act 51, and then it's going to take two-thirds of what? The House and the Senate to ever reform it. Right, Leon? That's what I think is important, but I'm sure you're going to hear from my other colleagues that sit with me. I'm damn proud of the legislators, especially the ones that come up from Macomb. We're a chain. We're not a link. And when we bind together like a chain, we're very strong up there. We are good people doing the work of the people. And at the end of the day, I don't want to hear nothing else except this. We're all together in this. 
Thank you for the invite. I appreciate your time. Love to have more dialogue on this issue, but I'm limited. Have Thank a great you, day. Thank you, Senator. You see, you're passionate. That's exactly what I meant. Thank you very much. You're welcome. And we have Senator Voino. Boy, following Pete Lucido is definitely a hard act to follow, isn't it? <laughs> My goodness. Uh, commissioners, thank you for uh, the invitation here to uh, meet with you. This is the first time that I've had the opportunity as a uh, state senator, and I am the state senator in District 9. That is the communities of Warren, Centerline, East Point, Roseville, Frazier, and a small portion of uh, Clinton Township. Uh, the committees that I've been assigned to are Health and Human Services, that is chaired by Senator Kurt Vanderwall, and the Regulatory Reform Committee, which is chaired by Senator Eric Nesbitt. And also, I am the Minority Vice Chair of the Elections uh, Committee, and that's chaired by Ruth Johnson. Um, I want to touch a little bit about what Pete had addressed as it relates, relates to Public Act 51. Yes, this is something that I think our whole delegation here in Macomb, uh, I know, uh, agrees upon, that it needs to be uh, addressed. And one thing, though, that uh, Senator Lacito failed to mention is that I think we have a dynamic and a great working relationship in our state Senate, a good bipartisan uh, coalition. I've had the opportunity to uh, work with Senator Lacito uh, and be part of several bills uh, with him and also uh, working with Senator McDonald as well. We've had the opportunity to uh, work together. And in fact, the, uh, the one bill package that I worked on with Senator uh, Lacito was a four bill package. And it deals, of course, with the opioid crisis and um, providing Narcon uh, in our public libraries here in the state of Michigan. Cities of Ann Arbor, City of Lansing, they've had multiple events uh, over the past several years, primarily with homeless uh, individuals. But when I mean we have a great working relationship, that four bill package went through the Senate, went through the House, and just several weeks ago, it was signed into law by uh, Governor Whitmer. And I do want to thank Senator Aceto for his hard work on that package in getting it through the Senate. Thank you. Oh, he's gone already. <laughs> Um, <laughs> say he, 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 oh, he is a slippery one, something. isn't he? Uh, I'm sure if he knew uh, I was going to be complimenting him, he uh, he would have uh, hung around a little bit uh, a little bit uh, longer. But two of the initiatives that I have been working on, as I mentioned, is the uh, the initiative that was just signed into law uh, by Governor uh, Whitmer. And uh, that was the, uh, the Narcon package. Uh, the other initiatives that I've been uh, involved in, I am the minority vice chair of the elections committee. And I've had a background as the Warren City Clerk for 11 years. And one of uh, the things that I've been most interested in as a clerk years ago is that our military personnel were unable to return their ballots electronically. And we've tried to uh, introduce legislation uh, through various representatives through the years and being on the committee uh, with uh, Ruth Johnson. Uh, Ruth and I had put together uh, a package and we did get that bill, uh, those bills out of committee which would permit our military personnel, of course not only here in Macomb County but throughout the state of Michigan where they could return their ballots electronically. They would not have to be uh, mailed uh, back to us. And I know it's something that may not change the world or change the way we live on a daily basis, but it's something that I know our military personnel have asked for. 24 states already permit military personnel to return their ballots electronically, and hopefully Michigan will soon become the 25th state. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Do, do, do. Um, briefly, I'd like to just touch upon some of the other initiatives that I've had the opportunity to, uh, to work with. Um, 19, in 1998, our state uh, legislature provided a rebate from the Michigan Catastrophic Claims Fund. And through the years, that rebate has not been initiated again. Uh, one of the first initiatives that I introduced as a state center was to call on another rebate. All of us know that we have over $24 billion in that fund. 
and I know there's debate as to whether or not we could use that money uh, for the roads, but uh, that is a, a debate that will go on uh, in the courts for some time, but I've called for another rebate for the citizens here in Michigan, which in today's dollars would equal approximately $287 per vehicle. Our pension tax, I've introduced legislation as well as three other legislators have to reverse the pension tax on our seniors here in the state of Michigan. Our wrongful imprisonment uh, bill is a bill that's presently in Senator Lucido's committee and he has uh, indicated that he does want to move that bill, but I do have to give credit to my predecessor, uh, State Senator Steve Bita. It was a bill that Steve ran through the system and it died in lame duck, and what it would do for those who are wrongfully imprisoned, uh, it would provide compensation for them, and that compensation would be based on the time that they served in prison. And we now have $10 million that have been appropriated in this fund, and Senator Lucido has uh, indicated that once we do get past the budget process here, he'll be taking that up in uh, committee. I've had the opportunity to work with Senator Lucido and Mike McDonald on some animal rights legislation, and I'm also a member of our Elder Abuse Task Force. Our Elder Abuse Task Force that's headed up by our Attorney General will be uh, putting together a uh, bipartisan package of bills here in the next uh, several weeks, as well as human trafficking bills, a member of that task force as well. Uh, so with that, I uh, won't go on and belabor uh, you anymore with information, but I do want to thank you for the opportunity to be here. And again, this is my first time, uh, and I look forward to uh, being here again next year. Thank you so much. S Senator Voino, please step back up for a second. <coughs> Commissioner Sager would like to say a few words for you. Just thank a you. minute. The, I, I'm honored to have you as my senator, but to be... I just was informed by the Michigan Library Association you have been selected as the Legislator of the Year. Thank you. Quite an honor, Paul. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Senator McDonald. Do we have Senator McDonald? I didn't see him. Just in the way. Thank you. Well, first of all, congratulations, Paul. Thank Seriously, and I'm glad you got to follow Pete Lacido. By the way, <laughs> I don't, I don't ever. I always got to follow Pete. So, I'll oh, yeah, bring this up a little bit. So, the communities I represent are Sterling Heights, Clinton Township, and Macomb Township. The committees that I'm on, I'm on appropriations. Within appropriations, I'm on colleges, I'm on health care, I'm on roads, and I'm the vice chair of Laura. I'm also on health policy and I'm on oversight for the state, so quite a few. So if you need anything, let me know, please. And I want to echo what Pete said, too. We are truly a team in the Senate and the House, and I want to thank my colleagues in the House as well. And we are a team and a bipartisan team at that. So you have to know in Macomb that the county commissioners can reach out to us anytime for anything. As far as some specific initiatives that I'm involved in, uh, not to steal a line from Mark Hackle, but Macomb County, little story about Macomb, we are a working class county, and we're the home of defense, not only for the state, but for the whole Midwest of the United States. Uh, I've uh, been in charge or, or helped appropriate uh, something called the Michigan Launch Initiative, which is hoping to turn the state into a space state. Gotten calls from Florida, gotten calls from Texas. They say, we have a bigger economic opportunity in this state than ever before, and that goes back to Henry Ford. And Macomb County will be the biggest benefactor of this, I promise you that. Uh, some other ones, I've helped with the animal abuse legislation based on the Sterling incident, which we all fortunately are aware of. Uh, the opioid crisis, I've been very heavily involved with Families Against Narcotics. And uh, Pete Lacido has been a huge, huge support on that as well. <clears throat> as far as my health care background, Health care is going to be a big one for me because I have a doctoral degree in health care. I'm going to be presenting my doctoral study in Florida next January, and it's on obesity. And I'm hoping to at least start to provide legislation on curing obesity. And there's a big mental health component to that. So anybody that wants to champion mental health services in Macomb County, I think my legislation will help be able to do that in the future. Um, I also made it so the police and the fire can now use epinephrine which for some reason they weren't able to before, but now they can with some of the legislation that I passed. Um, as far as the Macomb County residents, I just want you to know that I am going to work bipartisan to make sure Macomb County 
is represented well in the state of Lansing, or I'm sorry, the area of Lansing. And I want to make sure that the state of Michigan is successful, but most importantly, I want to make sure Macomb County gets what's coming to them, because we've, we've been a donor area for way, way too long. So thank you. Thank you. Representative Cherkin. <laughs> you know, he—he he, he, you were well hidden back there. I was looking around and uh, starting to wonder. I'll, I will put you. I'll—I'll I'll put him at the back if he wants to go at the at last. Um, Re Representative Shannon. Thank you so much, Madam Commissioner. Hello to the Board of Commissioners today. Uh, I am Representative Nate Shannon. I represent half of Sterling Heights, so the eastern portion of um, uh, the eastern portion of Sterling Heights and a small portion of Warren. Um, currently, the committees that I'm serving on in uh, in Lansing, uh, I'm on transportation, which is chaired by uh, Representative Jack O'Malley. Um, I am also on energy, which is chaired by Joe, uh, Representative Joe Bellino. Um, so, to, uh, with regard to the initiatives that I'm, I'm involved in, uh, there are a couple things that uh, I'm very proud of that we've started, uh, along with my, represent, with my colleague, Representative Lori Stone. Uh, we are both former educators, and so we have developed a bipartisan uh, educators caucus, and we're hopeful that we can come up with some uh, legislation that will that will benefit our education system in, in, in Michigan in a bipartisan fashion. And I'm very proud to be a part of that group with Lori. Um, also, with uh, um, another initiative that, was, that I was involved in was uh, Representative Jack O'Malley. Because roads is such a hot button issue, and I'm on transportation, I'm on the policy side, not on appropriations, uh, uh, Representative O'Malley really wanted to get down to the heart of what it takes to build a road. So uh, we have, uh, all of the members of that uh, transportation committee, uh, we voluntarily met twice a week for six weeks and had experts come in and testify about what it takes to build roads. And it was enlightening, but it also sheds light on how complicated it is. And uh, as uh, Pete Lucido, uh, I'm sorry, Rep uh, Senator Lucido and Senator Bueno were, were speaking of, something with, uh, uh, in, in PA 51 needs to be changed. And we are, in my office, we're working on uh, possible ways of dismantling PA 51. Um, we're kind of in the early infant stages of that, and so uh, hopefully within the next few uh, months we'll have more information on on uh, you know our six uh, you know a success in trying to dismantle p51 wherever we can uh, as far as bills that I've introduced I just had my f uh, first uh, vote on a bill that I introduced a few months back it came before transportation it's a bill that would uh, make it so that your driving record uh, minor infractions would come off your record after three years instead of the current seven years uh, it was uh, it was uh, unanimous, unanimously voted uh, in favor, and it is now in ways and means, and I'm hoping at, after that process it'll come to the floor for a vote because it was bipartisan. Um, and so we're very hopeful that that bill will come through because we think that, uh, you know, talking about car insurance that we haven't spoke of recently because this was a few months back, but we looked at it as a, a potential way of saving people money on their car insurance. Uh, also, I've uh, dropped a bill for a sales tax holiday um, on school supplies. So one Saturday uh, in August, hopefully starting in 2021, I believe, um, there will be a sales tax holiday on school supplies to try and save money for parents and students and then also teachers. Uh, because we uh, all know that teachers are spending their own money to supply their classrooms. Um, I guess as far as uh, explaining any issue that will be coming up uh, that the commissioner should be aware of, obviously in the next two weeks we have to have a budget done and that'll be something that we're going to need to, uh, you know, to keep, a, keep our eye on to see how Macomb County benefits um, and uh, I, I, hope, I hope we will. Um, and so I think that I covered all the questions I believe. Um, I'll be here for any questions that the commissioners may have uh, at the end. So thank you so much. Thank you. Representative Stone. Not too fast. <laughs> right. Is there a speed limit? Um. 
Um, I'm Representative Lori Stone. I represent District 28, which is the western half of Warren and all of Centerline. I serve on the Education Committee, Health Policy, and Financial Services. Uh, some of the initiatives I've been working on include um, addressing attacks on health care workers. Um, I, right now I'm working on some policy on, on signage. We know that um, this is an issue that is very concerning that um, working in high stress situations like in health care, um, people aren't always on their best behavior and sometimes need to be reminded that they're held to the same standards as everyone else for observing um, assault and other uh, policies. Um, I had the honor of hosting the Progressive Women's Caucus listening tour stop to Macomb County this summer in uh, recognition of the 100th anniversary for women's rights to vote in Michigan. We were able to bring some of the legislation that we've been working on in Lansing on our task forces to our local citizens as well as listening to what issues are affecting women here in Macomb County. And any issue, not just health care, that faces women are women's issues. Um, but at the heart of it, I am an educator. I am a master's in education with over almost 15 years in the classroom in Fitzgerald Public Schools. And um, there are a lot of issues that are close to my heart that need the a light shined on them in Lansing because we know that's where decisions for curriculum and budgeting are. Um, I proposed legislation to expand access to the Great Start Readiness Program which would offer children with the greatest need, financial need, the opportunity to attend early childhood um, education and we know that the greater the foundation is earlier um, the greater equality there is to pursuing education into K-12. Um, we also have issues in the state with teacher shortages. I just saw a meme recently about how the issue isn't necessarily that there's teacher shortages, that it's we're looking for um, professionals with master's degree and advanced degrees that are willing to work for $35,000 a year. This is a problem. Um, when we have to compete for talent, and we want talent, um, we need to be able to fund educational institutions to attract and maintain that talent. Um, a personal issue for me as a fourth grade teacher is the concern that um, the third grade reading retention law is, goes into effect for this year's third graders. Uh, it's been something that's been on the radar since they were in kindergarten. However, we know that there are some far-reaching implications for retaining children beyond kindergarten and first grade. And I think it's something we need to take a serious look at because this affects districts across Macomb County and across the state of Michigan. And then ultimately advocating for adequate and equitable funding. So we have numbers from the Education Finance Research Collaborative that spell out that Public education in Michigan is underfinanced by almost 2,000 a year for the typical student. We also know that there is almost double the need and funds for resources for students who have a special education certification, are English language learners, and children in poverty. And there is not a district across the state that is trying to tighten their belt and make ba budgets balance but aren't, don't have the funds necessary to provide the academics as well as the support resources for their students at the levels we know they need. So that's what I'm working on. Thank you. Thank you. So before I go on to the rest, I just want to, for some that were unable to attend, I want to make sure there aren't representatives that I'm unaware of. So. Um, are there uh, any representatives for Senator Lowers, Representative Hertel, or Representative Marino? I suspected as much. Please step forward. I had a little help suspecting. <laughs> 
Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Mary Kay Sogi. I am the Constituent Relations Director for Representative Marino. Representative Marino has the 24th District. I am part of Clinton Township, the northern part, southern part of Macomb, and all of Harrison Township. Uh, Representative Marino is the Chair of Commerce and Tourism. He's the Vice Chair of Local Government and Municipalities, Elections and Ethics, along with military veterans and homeland security. He uh, is a person who is a chairperson on that. Um, if you have any questions, you can call the office at any time, and I'll be able to help you, uh, you know, guide you towards Representative Marino. And we, Barry Sosnicki is our legislative director. He does the bills with Representative Marino. Thank you for having me have the opportunity to come up and speak. Thank you. Representative Herring Farrington. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you, board commissioners, for having me. Um, obviously, I'm Representative Farrington. I am in my second start of my second term. I represent the 30th House District, which is the all of Utica, the western part of uh, Sterling Heights, so the other part of Nate Channon, and obviously the southern part of Shelby. Um, I currently chair financial services. I am in my second term of ser uh, sitting as the chairwoman of financial services. I also sit on House Judiciary this year, Reg Reform, and Tax Committee. There are two personal items um, that are very I've been very passionate about the last uh, since I started in my uh, term here as a legislator, and one is expanding financial literacy in our schools. I think it's very important that we try to give the tools available to our young ones in order to make the decisions they need to make when it comes to financial issues. Um, today, we are $1 trillion in debt. The average person has only saved $5,000 in their savings account. So I think it's pretty important that we try to educate our young ones as far as uh, financial literacy goes. The other thing I'm really passionate about is data breach. Um, I have actually introduced legislation twice, last year and again this year. Um, I am really working hard on this piece of legislation. I think it's very important that we up the notification timeline for people to be notified when their data is breached. Um, right now there is no time frame. So I think it's very important that we uh, try to come to uh, agreement on this piece of legislation and you get something through. Uh, those are the things that I'm really, really passionate about. Um, hoping I can get those through the finish line here and uh, we will answer any, and of course roads. I mean, everybody's talked about it. I won't talk about it anymore. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, and I said Harrington at first because I've got a bunch of Harringtons in my background, so it just came flying I'm out. Not say anything. <laughs> <laughs> Representative Sarvi. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thanks for the ability to come before you today. It's great to be back before this body. As many of you know, I used to serve as a county commissioner started 30 years ago, served for four terms uh, before I became uh, elected uh, for five terms as the treasurer of Clinton Township and now proudly serving in my second term as a state representative. And great to look around the room and see some of my old friends that I served with like Commissioner Myjack and Commissioner Sauger and Commissioner Brown. So I know you all are still proudly serving your communities. So you provide us with a script to stick to and I'll try to stick to that as much as possible. I represent District 31, which takes in roughly two-thirds of Clinton Township, all of the city of Mount Clemens, and all of the city of Frazier, which I proudly serve. The committees I serve on, I'm in my second term uh, in the Education Committee, which is a policy committee. I'm in my second term serving as the Minority Vice Chairman of Natural Resources Committee, which is also a policy committee. And I'm new uh, in another policy committee serving in the Local Government and Municipal Finance Committees. Initiatives I've been working on, one I'm, I'm, I'm proud to be working on and continue to work on. I, I offered this last uh, term. I've offered it again as a bill for this term, and this is regarding payday lending. And many of you may know of the payday lending companies around our communities like 
Vance, uh, uh, America, others. Um, and what this is, is this is House Bill 4251, which will increase payday lending consumer protections. Uh, payday lenders lend money to customers for a maximum period of 30 days, but with very high fees attached to it. Unfortunately, many of our constituents get caught up in a debt cycle and have to keep taking out payday loans to pay back that previous loan that they had. My legislation prohibits a person from taking out more than one payday loan within a 30-day period of time. Uh, research shows that in Michigan, 70% of payday loans are taken out on the same day as a previous loan has been paid. My bill also requires the payday loan store to determine whether someone has a reasonable ability to repay the loan through a specific uh, formula of debt versus income. Payday lenders have removed over $513 million from Michigan's economy over the past five years. Macomb County is estimated to have at least 48 payday lending stores, which has drained over $8 million from Macomb County alone. Furthermore, over two-thirds of payday lending franchise stores in Michigan are owned by out-of-state or foreign companies. We need to in increase consumer protection and oversight of payday lending institutions and help allow our constituents to exit their debt cycle and return to spending their disposable income, stimulating our local economy. The other issue I'm passionate about that I'm working on, I introduced it last term with numerous other uh, uh, representatives. It has been reintroduced this term actually with bipartisan support across the board. And this has to do with personal financial disclosure of statewide uh, elected uh, officials within state government. So I introduced House Bill 4646 of this package. And it's part of an eight bill partisan pack bipartisan package that requires the governor, lieutenant governor, attorney general, Secretary of State, state legislators, state legislative candidates, Supreme Court justices, and certain other elected officials to release their personal financial information. The package will statutorily mandate that elected officials release information regarding their sources of income, property, stocks, and other outside employment. Michigan is one of only two states that does not require some level of personal financial disclosure from state lawmakers, the other state being Utah. I've always operated on the belief that citizens have an expectation that their elected officials will use their positions not to enrich themselves, but instead to benefit, benefit the people they represent. It's about transparency. Uh, through mandatory financial disclosure, we can shed sunlight or conflicts of interest and increase government transparency and accountability. Macomb County residents deserve to know if their elected officials are enriching themselves off of the bills that they may be trying to pass or the bills that get signed or the legislation that they are determining the outcome of or even court renderings. This bill package was recently voted out of committee and is awaiting further legislative review before the House Ways and Means Committee. Um, so those are the two issues that I'm passionate about. I've gone on long enough. Happy to answer questions later. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Hornberger. <laughs> thank you. Good afternoon and thank you for having me. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to come before you guys and speak. I am Pamela Hornberger. I represent the 32nd District, which is northern Macomb County and a big piece of St. Clair County. So I have um, Chesterfield Township in New Baltimore and then a piece of Memphis and Richmond that I share with uh, Representative Yarrick. Um, Casco Township, Columbus Township, Ira Township, Kenoki Township, Kimball, Riley, and Wales Townships in St. Clair County. Um, so my St. Clair County people would ask you, guys why you don't go out for a roads millage 
So just throwing it out there, because that's what I get having two, two um, very different points of view on roads from counties. Um, I am the associate speaker pro tem for the House of Representatives, and um, I chair the House Education Committee. I am one of um, two representatives who holds a dual role in uh, policy and appropriations. I am also the vice chair of the Appropriations Subcommittee on School Aid in the Department of Education. Um, so if you were watching, paying attention this week, we passed out two um, budgets um, to hopefully um, are on the governor's desk, and hopefully she'll be signing them with some record school funding. Um, I also sit on the Elections and Ethics Committees and the um, Health Policy Committees. And of note, um, there's lots of legislation that I've um, sponsored and lots of different opinions that I have about things. But of note, two things that you guys would be interested in, um, House Bill 4937, um, sponsored by Representative Ann Bolin, and House Bill um, 4938, sponsored by Representative Sarah Leitner, are um, bills that would make county commissioner terms four-year terms. So, just so you guys are aware of those. It's yeah. already on our radar. I Thank figured you. it was. So, um, I'm a co-sponsor, and any um, input or help you guys need with that or anything else, I'm always available. And if you call my office and it happens to be a county issue, I have someone who can take care of that, too. <laughs> so, thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Representative Yark. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Representative Jeff Yark. I represent the 33rd House District. Uh, that uh, includes New Haven, Lenox, Richmond, as I said, the Richmond, the Macomb County portion of Richmond, the Memphis, the Macomb County portion of Memphis. We get into most of Macomb Township, Ray, and all of Armada. You know, covers my area. I'm uh, very proud to say I, I left the fire service a few years ago. So I left the firehouse to go into the state house. Uh, as, as I see, uh, one of my constituents, Commissioner Drillette's here. I know you like to pride yourself as the taxpayer's best friend, but there's a new best friend in Lansing. I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, just want to talk about if it's my, some of my assignments. I'm the Approps Committee. I have DHHS. I'm the Vice Chair of Transportation. I'm the Chair of LARA, and uh, I'm also on Judiciary. So but I am going to talk a little bit about roads, but like what I've done on roads. Uh, if, if anybody caught uh, County Executive Hackle's little press conference, you show a little lemonade stand as a potential local op funding option. I want to be clear, there is no local funding option for lemonade stands discussed in Lansing. So if anybody here was hoping for that, just want to let you know, no discussion of that. So, you know, see somebody else. But for real solutions, we have House Bill 4262, which is my bill, which was to accelerate the 2015 roads plan. Actually, the uh, transportation budget came out of conference committee and actually includes accelerating the 2015 roads plan, which includes, you know, every year we are going to put more general fund money into roads. And so next year it was going to be 600 million. I mean, the following year, 2021, we're actually, and ours is going to be doing it this year. So that was really part of something that I really advocated for was let's move that plan up. Let's not wait until 2021. We looked at 42, 4062. Uh, you had an individual talking about lane miles versus road miles. Uh, center line miles versus road mi lane miles. Again, you know, Obviously, we have a problem with Macomb County, uh, how Act 51 treats us. So that's actually my bill. I'm proud to say that uh, most of the Macomb County uh, representatives joined me on this, very bipartisanly fighting. Uh, Tim Skubik, if you see some of his, you know, see, watch him, he came to my office and stopped. He goes, well, how do you think you're going to change Act 51 when nobody else did? And I said, well, when it's just wrong, it's wrong, and you just keep pushing because this is how we are in Macomb County. We'll just keep pushing. Uh, so you're absolutely correct. I mean, we uh, have 8.7% of the population. We get 7% of the money. Uh, Southeast Michigan generates 57% of the GDP with 46% of the population. And I continue to remind our, our northern legislators that when we do well, we go snowmobiling. And when we do bad, we stay home and it stays in the drive and they do bad. So that they should really think about how they support Southeast Michigan. Because autonomous vehicle technology is not going to go to Sheboygan. It's going to come to Southeast Michigan. So I continue to remind them of that. House Bill 4093, which is another bill of mine, is to take money from economic development and refocus that on roads because I think instead of incentivizing a company with paying for their roof or their capital investment if for example mound isn't in my district but if you're an entrepreneur thinking about coming to Michigan because you want to be part of the 
autonomous technology, TARDAC, GM Tech Center, uh, Chrysler, so forth. You want to be a part of all that's going on, and you drive down Mount and you say, do I really want to invest here and have my trucks get beat up? I think our initial investment needs to be on roads. Then we can talk about uh, corporate uh, welfare. But at this point, I think we need to really focus at that. I will tell you some of the things in the newspapers don't uh, paint a complimentary picture of the legislature. It's uh, kind of funny how that is. Uh, I think we, overwhelmingly in my district, we don't want a, a gas tax increase, but I think the House has really focused on fixing our road system. And I know that there was a lot of media kind of making jokes about selling the Blue Water Bridge. It was not intended, because uh, I'm on the committee that discussed it, the, the intention wasn't to take money from that and put it towards roads. And since the media seems to have like a, only, their depth is about this much to actually understand the issue, they kind of hold on to, oh, the legislature wants to sell the Blue Water Bridge. And that creates a lot of clicks, which does a lot you know, for their, for their advertising, but it's really not the truth, what the story is. The focus has been focusing MDOT on roads and stop having them into ancillary things like owning the Blue Water Bridge. I get no complaints. Nobody's called me and said we have a problem with the Ambassador Bridge, which is privately owned. But so one of the discussions is, can we move? We own four airports. We own four airplanes. We own some railroad line. These are all distractions to MDOT in trying to focus their energy on roads. So we're pushing them to sell some of the airplanes. We're trying to sell some of the railroad. Uh, I think the Blue Water Bridge is off the table at this point. Uh, they said some of the airports, the Romeo Airport, which does, its use continues to go down every year and is not an economic generator for northern Macomb County, uh, at least the current arrangement that uh, Macomb County has, uh, we should say the state has with the local operator. So maybe the state should get out of this business because we own very small airports. We don't own the Detroit Metro or anything like that. So focus, you know, the idea is refocusing our efforts just on roads. Uh, we talk about, uh, I just want to kind of mention, one of the complaints, I think my district is taxed out. That's what I hear from my district. You know, we started about donor being a donor county. And a lot of the questions that I get is that, you know, should Macomb County still be donating to the DIA? And should Macomb County be donating to the zoo? So we're paying for a zoo that's in another county. We're paying roads in Sheboygan. We're paying for a DIA that's in Detroit. Maybe we should focus on roads in Macomb County and refocus our energy here. So that's some of the questions that I get in my district. Uh, I would say I will say I did co-sponsor the four years. So I appreciate uh, Representative Hornberger bringing that to to make your terms four years. I think you're more functional with a four-year term. I will also, we, the uh, a gentleman came up here to talk about suicides. I will tell you that's another place that Macomb County got hit really hard. There was an issue of money being taken away from Macomb County mental health. I think the Macomb County delegation worked really hard, tried to bring more, some of that back, and we're still fighting again. Some of the games in Lansing has really hurt Macomb County, and it's important that I think bipartisanly we, we try to you know, really stay together. And I think it's an important point to bring up. I think the Michigan legislature, despite a lot of some of the media that likes to spin things up, I will tell you a lot of times the media the, will show up on the day we vote a bill and not actually for the full discussion, so they think that's the only day we talked about the bill. Uh, and some of the writers that are writing about some of these bills, I never see them until that day, and then they think there was a deal in the middle of the night when we've actually talked about it for months. I suggest they maybe come to Lansing a few other times and see what's happening. Uh, the biggest question on your minds probably is, is there going to be a budget? I, I will tell you that you know, Congress really disappointed us when they shut down the government because our first and foremost job is to keep government running. Make people confident that government is functioning for them. And whether you're Republican or Democrat, you have to, we have to move past our own partisan views and get a budget done. And I guarantee you that that effort is going on. The discussions have gone on all summer despite some of the conversations that have been had in the newspaper. Governor Snyder and the leadership have talked all summer. And I will tell you this, and I was very disappointed that Congress, many of them went home when the government was shut down. I will not be la leaving Lansing September 30th if we don't have a budget. I'm staying there until it gets done. And I'm very confident that we are going to get it done because we understand that we have to sometimes put our partisan politics aside and keep government running. So if there's any questions, I'll take them. If not, you can stop me later. Well, we're going to do the questions at the end, which we're almost, we're almost through. So okay. I just figured you. Commissioner Durant would probably get all excited and no, hit me. No, <laughs> I already beat him up already on that, so I'm not going to do it again. <laughs> Representative Wozniak. Hey, 
Thank you, Board, for this opportunity to speak with you. My name is Doug Wozniak. I represent Sorry about that. District 36. That is uh, Shelby, Washington, Romeo, and Bruce. Uh, if you recall a few years ago, it's the area represented by Pete Lacido. Mm -hmm. So I talk about a good cop, bad cop relationship with Senator Lacido. I'm the good cop. <laughs> <laughs> so, but as Pete mentioned in his uh, speech, the group here in Macomb uh, has coalesced over the last year, and I'm a newbie, so I have felt that we have a really good cooperative spirit in Macomb, both Democrats and Republicans. You know, we attend functions together, Representative Stone and uh, Representative Shannon, and even Mr. Churkin back there. <laughs> so, but we all, we all talk about the ideas and what we can do for Macomb and how we can make Macomb better. Uh, on a personal note, I'm a practicing attorney. I specialize in elder law, state planning, probate, Medicaid, veterans benefits, Medicare, conservatorships, guardianships, which have been in the news here in Macomb a little bit. Um, so I continue my practice. I have three attorneys that work for me. Uh, but that has given me an initiative to really look at elder abuse in this state, which the uh, AG is also looking into. I formulated a package of bills for elder abuse that have just passed out of committee, which is going to make it more obtuse for a person to endanger, abuse, neglect, or isolate an elder. When that happens, we're going to make sure that that person gets punished. And what happened earlier in the old statute was that only a non-relative could be punished. So let's say if Marv had a son that took $100,000 from him, we couldn't punish him because it was a relative. So I've changed that statute to include relatives since 63% of the crimes are committed by relatives when it comes to elder abuse. Uh, the current committees that I serve on, I'm the, I'm the vice chair for the joint committee on all of the administrative rules that come out of the legislature. I'm on the judiciary committee, which is pretty good since I'm an attorney. Um, health policy, because I'm involved in health care as an attorney. My wife's been a year a nurse for 40 years, and my daughter is a pediatrician from U of M. I say U of M because my wife's a Sparty and I'm a Wolverine. <laughs> so we have some interesting discussions. I'm also on uh, families, children, and seniors, and communications and technology. Now you might consider communications and technology somewhat strange to have with the other committees I'm on, but when you look at what we want to do in this state and in Macomb County is create an atmosphere where we've got technology covering the whole state broadband, whatever it takes to get telemedicine to people that can't get to it. We have rural areas that are in dire need of practitioners. And practitioners, you know, aren't going to move someplace for free. We have to figure out how to make it profitable for them to move there, or if they've graduated, say, from one of our graduate medical schools, to stay there. And that includes the UP. So that's an initiative that I'm working on. Another initiative that I just passed, or, or just dropped last week, is Bill 4862. That entitles a health care worker, including physicians, to seek help with any type of critical incident stress management that they have may have had. They were left out of the original statute, but this gives them the confidentiality where they don't have to worry about being exposed as having a situation, a problem that they might have. I would say that mental health, and I believe David's going to speak a little later, your uh, community health commissioner or director, mental health is probably one of the biggest things in this state that we need to cure. 25 percent of our prisoners have some type of mental health problem. When they get out, they're likely to be put back. 
we have to change that. So we're just passing some initiatives to make sure that they get a mental health review before they're released. And two weeks later, they get a follow-up phone call. And if need be, we keep intervening to make sure that they don't come back into our system. Right now, we've dropped our prison population from 53,000 down to 38,000. And we can do better than that. Of course, that means we're spending less money on prisons. But it makes sure that our population going back is going to be profitable for us, that they're going to make money, that they're going to be able to succeed in their own life and not go back into prison. We've talked a little bit about roads. I'll just touch on them really quickly. I believe that uh, the initiatives that Senator Lucido has put forward make sense, particularly for Macomb. We're getting beat up. We don't, need, we don't deserve that. We need the money for our roads. Auto no fault we passed earlier this year. When we did that, we wanted to make sure that the residents of Michigan saved money. And we're making sure that that's going to happen. Now, many people complain that that auto no fault policy that or the, uh, the bill that was passed is onerous. It could be, but we're going to look at tweaking it as we go. I personally have already dropped a bill that changes the amount of deductibles that can be charged on the health side of your auto policy, such that it goes up to the average cost of a no-fault accident in that year. So you could have a deductible up to $35,000, but the average cost then gets eliminated from any of your PIP claim or any type of catastrophic claim. So it eliminates all of that funding that needs to go into the catastrophic claim, so you can see that fund get reduced. But also, your premium's going to go down because you've got a high deductible. Well, how do you pay a $35,000 deductible? Well, if you're fortunate enough to have the money, you pay it. If you have a third-party tort, you sue. But also, your employer health insurance could cover that deductible. And they have a certainty then that they're not going to have to put out for years and millions of dollars to cover your health insurance. It's already covered. And then your PIP coverage takes over. So that, we're working on that. Um, opiates, we touched on that a little bit. Um, it's, and I know Rep Yark has worked on that quite a bit because he's a fireman. But we're also looking at uh, having opiate vaccines. And if that comes through, it's going to be very, very important for any state in this union. Um, doo -doo, doo -doo, doo -doo. I would think that you have probably a good set of legislature people that will listen to what you have to say. We'll, we try to take care of Macomb. I'm proud to be from Macomb. I've stayed in the east, on the east side my whole life. I was born in Harper Woods. When we moved to Chicago for a couple of years, I said, we're going back to the east side. And that's where we've resided ever since. So I'm proud to say my daughter went through Utica schools. I'm proud to say my district has two of the top 10 school districts in the whole state. And Ike beat Romeo last Friday. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I know Thank it, I know you. it. Yeah, Commissioner, yeah, sorry. But the Thank truth you. came out. <laughs> okay. I, was, I was rolling till I said that, right? Yeah. All right. Thank you. All right. Thanks. I, I do not see Kevin. So, um, Representative Churkin, you're up. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. John Churkin. 32119, Merrily, Roseville, <laughs> Michigan. Uh, Representative Warniak, who's that? Go green, go white. Okay, Jeff, I, I, I got to say a few words when I get up here, but uh, Jeff, you'll never have a pink pig. You'll never live up to Leon. <laughs> For the record, my name is John Churkin. I am the 22nd District state representative and my district covers all of Roseville and the eastern portion of Warren from Shaner to Hayes. Uh, I am the senior member of the Macomb County delegation of, of our group. This is my third and last term. 
But what I do want to say to my colleagues that are all here is for the most part, we work very well together. We might have some philosophical differences, but when it comes to Macomb County, everybody's on board to take care of everybody's needs and wants in Macomb County. I just wanted to tell you a little bit about me, and I'll, and I'll refer it to later. Uh, for 29 years, I was a De Wayne County Deputy Sheriff, and when I retired, I was a commanding officer of the Internet Crimes Unit. So just keep that in your mind for right now. Uh, and I wanted to tell everybody, I actually did stay home this summer. I was waiting for a call from our leader to come take care of the budget by my phone every day. And one thing I can say is Jeff Yark was in his office every day. So he's very uh, conscientious. You heard, I don't want to say anything about the roads today. Pete Lacido covered it all, um, especially with Public Act 51. And, and I'll get into it later on. That's one of my bills that I'm trying to get some new money for uh, for the roads and for the state of Michigan. Uh, I sit on the regulatory reform uh, committee, which oversees LARA, which is the Licensing and Regulatory Affairs Committee and Regulations, Communications and Technology. Remember Communications and Technology. Veterans, Military, State, Police, and Homeland Security. Remember that one, too. One of my bills that I've, uh, one of my first bills I was working on was a package of gambling bills. There were revenue, uh, new revenue by them. This is something we, don't, we haven't done. Sports betting, fantasy football, and charity gambling. And uh, we're a little bit apart because the governor wants 18% in tax revenue and, and uh, everybody else wants eight. So hopefully within the next couple of weeks, we'll get that taken care of after the budget's been done. Uh, one of my bills was a special task force for campus uh, crimes, and it was a task force made up of state, municipal, and sheriff's deputies and AG prosecutors. So if anybody had something like the Larry Nasser crime, uh, they would oversee that. Uh, one of the other bills I'm working on is a vote for police and fire for millages. If you have a city that's only have 15,000 up to 150,000, you can't put a tax millage for police and fire on like townships you can do. So I'm trying to change that law with the bill. Uh, I did uh, sponsor a bill about domestic violence taking away the guns from bad actors in domestic violence disputes. And one of the ones that uh, I've been doing for two years, well actually two sessions, is the unemployment bills. I don't know if everybody's heard, but Two years ago, there was 92,000 uh, 92, people in the state of Michigan that got dinged by unemployment saying they had fraudulent claims when they didn't have fraudulent claims. So we're trying still to get that money back for them and doing new bills to make sure this doesn't happen to our population again. Uh, one of my bills was a $100 copay for insulin. You know, every, insulin prices have went up tenfold over the past 10 years. And me and uh, Representative Cam Benzi put two bills in to lower that for people that don't have insurance and to get the Attorney General to look into price gouging. And then I'm going to talk something that's really near and dear to my heart. So with, with uh, Representative Yarrick, I don't mean to pick on you today, Jeff, but you're just a good guy. We get along really good, as you can tell. We get along. Uh, we've been working with the zoo. Candace Miller, your, dep uh, your uh, Parks and Works, or not Parks and Works, uh, Public Works Director, and uh, Mark Hackle, the CEO, to bring uh, aquarium to uh, Macomb County. It'll be a state-of-the-art aquarium. I don't know if anybody in this room, when they were kids, if their school took trips out to the Children's Zoo out on Belle Isle or went to the aquarium on Belle Isle, but I think it's something that the whole state of Michigan needs, and right now they're looking to put it in our county, and I think that is a, a kudo to us for having it there. Now, I'll let you time me for three minutes. I want to talk about 911 tax. I've worked on this bill for a long time. I worked in communications and technology this year and last year oversight and reg reform. And we did a lot of work with AT&T, the state police, and all the stakeholders in this. And me being a police officer, I told you to keep that in your mind, you know, I see that this is for Macomb County not to have this service is a disservice to our residents. Our people, it's real time. 
if your wife or your spouse or your kids, your grandkids are going home at night and their car breaks down, when they call with this new system, they'll be able to know in real time where you're at and where you're going to be. The schools will have, we extended it for one year, but if they call from a classroom, the police will know exactly what classroom it is and where it's located. Within minutes, they can get there. And I just felt that 50 cents a phone isn't that bad of a price tag to pay for the safety of your loved ones in this county. Some counties have instituted this and some counties haven't. And I know there will be some people here that will argue, and I get the 50 cents. I get the taxes. You know, I understand that. But a dollar, more important than your family or your grandkids or whatever. Um, in the jail. I think we need a new jail. I worked in Wayne County. We had three jails. Still wasn't enough. They want to build a new one now. It just seems like you fill up a jail, you got to build another one. Fill that one up, you got to build another one. You know, there's a lot of reforms here in Lansing, and Pete Lacido talks about them, but that's not going to cover everybody in this, in this state of Michigan because there's still crimes being done, whether it's for poverty. Uh, crime is down now because the economy is at least doing pretty good and people have jobs. As long as that happens, crime will be down. But when that stops, crime's going to go back up again. You're going to need a jail again. And uh, I don't know whether to spend $2 million on refurbishing the one you got. I don't know. But this is John Chirk and the citizen speaking now. But I'll be around for questions afterwards. Thank you. I like that, Representative Churkin. Instead of us lecturing you, you're lecturing us. I appreciate that. <laughs> I, I do see uh, Mr. Forlini here for Congressman Mitchell. I'm not just walking in and walking out. <laughs> What's that? See We're, everything that's been covered already, so you thank you. We're thank allowing you. about 25 I, seconds per each person. Perfect, <laughs> perfect, perfect. I heard a little bit of uh, uh, Representative Turkin, and I thought he had some great things to say. So I'm sure I missed some good content. And I just wanted just I just just got off the plane this weekend, went back to Italy just on a personal note, real quick. Uh, and your certificate that you gave to the kids that they took is hanging on their wall. So. I uh, pr appreciate that, and I, I can show you the picture. I, I took it just so you can see that there was uh, uh, an appreciation for the for what you guys did. Um, Tony Forlini, again, uh, representing Congressman Mitchell. I'm his district director. Um, I found out about this meeting today, and so I'm kind of scrambling here. I, I didn't get a chance to talk with a congressman, but just to give you a few uh, tidbits of things that he's working on. He's, first off, he serves on the Armed Services Committee as well as the uh, infrastructure in Congress. So uh, you, the, the good thing about the first one, the Armed Services, this is a very important thing for our area, Macomb County. Um, we've got some great representation across the aisle in Michigan uh, working on, on this committee and uh, even in the Senate with uh, uh, Senator Peters. So uh, it's a good thing to have representation in Armed Services, particularly for as important as is that is for Macomb County, the, def the defense corridor. Um, I think if there's a couple things that the congressman want me to bring up, things that he's working on that he thinks, obviously you all know that he's retiring in a little less than a year and a half, but uh, there's two things that he really wants to see covered, and that is, uh, the first is he's got to build a college transparency act. There's over 11, I think it's 11 million students, that, if I got that number right, that are you know currently have college debt, and that's a that's a huge number. Yet there's no transparency for colleges to say exactly what is your opportunity. That once you get that degree, what's going to happen? How are you going to? Um, what kind of? What's your opportunity to get a job? You know, how many kids uh, and adults graduate and end up uh, you know working at Starbucks or or, or waitressing or or, or what's that? Or a county commissioner, <laughs> if they're so fortunate. <laughs> but you never know. So, so that's that's the thing, and that's and that's that's something he wants to make sure it, it's transparent. Um, um, and it's not just in this country. I guess I was just in Europe, and I got a cousin there that's a, a barista at a at a coffee shop. Yeah, she's got a college degree. It just the jobs weren't there for what she was studying for. 
Uh, the other thing is the USMCA. Uh, this is something that um, was a negotiation uh, between three countries, the uh, United States, Canada, and Mexico. And I think it's very important for our area that we get this new trade agreement uh, between our three countries. Uh, Mexico's already approved it. Canada's right now looking at it. And uh, the United States has yet to bring it uh, forth to Congress and uh, take up the issue. But we think it's very important. He thinks it's very important, for, particularly for our area, for the type of jobs we have here. And the 10th District, which includes northern Macomb County all the way through the Thumb, which is uh, quite a bit of agricultural products. So those are a few things, a couple of things I think that he would, uh, he would have wanted me to bring up. And uh, I appreciate you having this forum with uh, all the great speeches I missed. But uh, <laughs> thanks for having us. <laughs> Thank you. OK, so um, Kevin didn't show up, did he? I don't. OK, so. Um, then I'm just, I'm going to, I don't have any commissioners. Do commissioners have any questions? There's a button. <laughs> Am I on the wrong thing? <laughs> Commissioner Gillette. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, uh, the representative for uh, Senator Stabenow. Um, first, I want to thank you for the work that, uh, Senator Stabenow is doing trying to assure that we have uh, resources to protect the Great Lakes. I know that's been a priority of hers. Uh, I wanted to um, uh, point out uh, a project that our current Public Works Commissioner has been working on that I think we could use some help at the federal level with. And this may go to our federal representatives as well. But as you know, um, protecting the lake, especially uh, Lake St. Clair, from discharges of partially treated sewage or untreated sewage in unfortunate circumstances, is a very expensive proposition and uh, it would cost hundreds of millions of dollars to address the infrastructure to help reduce that um, in the traditional way. But uh, you may be aware that uh, our Public Works Commissioner has come up with a proposal to greatly expand the capacity for retaining uh, partially treated sewage. Yeah, the Chapton Drain Station and you know that, that project would cost about 10% of the cost of the traditional approach to addressing that issue. Is that something that you guys can help us get some of that funding for to save the big costs? Right. Yep. So actually, um, over a year ago, I think it was about a year and a half ago, Senator Stabenow actually was the first elected official to tour Chapitan. Um, so she was there from the, from the get-go. If you talk to uh, Commissioner Miller's office, we are in constant contact at our legislative aide in Washington. Um, Aaron Suntag is kind of leading the delegation effort on wording. Uh, the senator was actually able to get Macomb County wording in a piece of legislation. It actually said for CSO uh, separation in Macomb County, unfortunately, when the two bills came together, they decided that was considered earmark, an earmark, and so they had to take out Macomb County, but it was the only municipality listed, actually mentioned in the bill. Um, so the senator is very aware, like I said, we have almost monthly meetings with uh, the commissioner's office, and uh, I would be happy to uh, talk to you more about that at any point in time. But it's a huge issue in Macomb County. It's a huge issue around the country. Um, and it's really devastating when we have, you know, a rain event and, you know, we're, we're discharging sewage. And it's also equally frustrating when other communities and counties are sending their sewage through Macomb County into the lake as well. Well, I, I'm greatly appreciative and heartened by the fact that you guys are already working on that issue with the uh, Public Works Commissioner. Great. So thank you for that. And I hope that we can, you know, bear some results in the near future, because I think it's the most cost-effective proposal sure. I've heard. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Thank Chair. you, Commissioner Brown. Thank you. I echo that, Commissioner Gillette's comments. And that goes to the whole delegation. Water quality is number one in Macomb County. and so we all live here, we all have got a role to play, and the county's put millions of dollars towards their own local money to, to, to address solutions to these issues. And certainly having the federal help, as well as our state help, our partners in the legislature, to be mindful of those issues is, is very important. And, and we thank you for the work, because you have stepped up. Those of you who have served in the past, even those of you who are new, maybe haven't had an opportunity, but you will have again, um, is appreciated, because that lake's what makes Macomb County and Southeast Michigan a very attractive place to live and do business. 
it's an economic development issue as much as it is a, a, it was a quality of life issue as well. So um, I appreciate having all of your, I've been on this board a very long time and I can count on very few times we've had the entire delegation from members of Congress to every state official both part, on both parties in one room. And you're to be credited for that because many times people just blew us off. They didn't care. Wasn't there, just didn't see the advantage to them. But you're showing the entire public of all the county, regardless of where you live, that you care enough to come here in a public forum, tell them what you're doing, and take questions. And there won't be a lot of questions, but regardless, this is meeting is going to be broadcast around the county. And uh, you all deserve credit for what you're doing, because public service is thankless, as we all know. And uh, you get a lot of grief for what you do. But people also, but can just give you a forum to talk. Newspapers not being what they are, certainly there's fewer of them. <laughs> You can have opportunity to have your own words heard. And I said this, this will be broadcast throughout the county. So we appreciate your time and effort being here. And, and don't forget about community mental health here in Macomb County. We were gutted by outstate legislators <coughs> to pay for things. They took money away from families and children and disabled of all ages unfairly. They robbed us. Took millions of dollars away. Well, this is this area, Southeast Michigan, is where the clients are. Well, I guess we're, not tell, we're preaching to the choir because y'all you've been supporting us, but we ask you to do a little bit better. Maybe you can cut a deal with them out of state to to replace what they've taken because there's still serious needs that need to be addressed. And I kind of speak from experience. I've got more group homes in my district than anywhere in the in the county, and I interact with those the families, and they come to me with heartbreaking stories often about things that they need and services they need, and you know. We try to provide what we can, but oftentimes, sometimes, it's becoming a crisis, and it's becoming more so now with the actions that the state budget has done to them, to CMH. And again, this the, if it wasn't for the Macomb County delegation in a unified fashion last year. You put money back in, and we appreciate that. But there's still more work to be done, and um, so that's my two cents. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Madam Chairman. Thank you, Chair Smith. Thank you. And going with my original comment of not repeating what someone already said, I agree completely with uh, Commissioner Brown on how much we appreciate you showing up to this event year after year. And it, it is important to us, and I think it's important to show the residents how uh, well you all work together, to be honest with you. So I'd also like to thank Marv, because this was Marv Sagers drove this a couple years ago and got this going, and, and this was a great idea, and I'm surprised that no one really uh, came up with this before so Marv thank you this has turned out to be everything you thought it would be and, and more I want to recognize a couple members of our older adult advisory committee that are here and thank you for showing up there are members of the public that have shown up so I have a couple questions Detroit Zoo the Nature Center I'm in contact with the people from the zoo I know things are getting kind of close with some potential property is this a group effort on our uh, legislators to uh, to try to secure some money good for them for this because I know in would you like to speak? Because I know you have to leave in a second, so this might be your good segue. You know, we had the opportunity um, to sit down with the governor's uh, staff last week, myself, Representative Stone, Representative Hertel, Representative Shannon, and Representative uh, Cherkin. Cherkin, yes. <laughs> and um, we talked about that this is a priority for Macomb County. Okay. And it was also a priority for the governor when she ran, as far as roads was a priority and also uh, the environment and the, uh, the Great Lakes and, uh, and water. And uh, we've been working very hard on this issue to, uh, to promote it. And at that meeting, we re-emphasized over and over again. I know we need 400 or $4 million mm -hmm. uh, that would be uh, uh, put into the, uh, to the budget. Uh, there's $16 million in private funding as well. Correct. But um, we'd also like to see perhaps uh, some satellite centers around the state. But we want that. Uh, um, Great Lakes uh, Nature, Nature Center, uh, Center uh, here in Macomb, and we've been working very hard on it. And that's a bipartisan uh, uh, effort uh, as well. I know when we met with the governor's uh, staff last week, that was with the, uh, the Democratic uh, delegation, but everybody's been working in bipartisan fashion to promote it and ask for funding. Great, thank you. Looks like Commissioner Yark, I mean Representative Yark. I, I want to clarify something. Uh, I will say I don't support it coming out of the general fund. Uh, is my position. Uh, if I can find four million dollars, it's going to go to mental health. If I can find four million dollars, it's going to go to fix some roads. Uh, I'm just in talking to people in my district. Uh, that's where they like to see the money. I would say 
what I have said is that we have a, a natural resource trust fund, uh, which is, has millions upon millions of dollars, when, and that most of the investments outstate. And I've said, and I've directed the Detroit Zoo director to look to that money. That fundamentally, since Macomb County doesn't get its fair share, I think, out of that fund, that they should be looking at that fund. Um, so we to get our fair share of that pot of money. Or if you want to look at it as economic development, I would just say I don't want to. I'm going to be transparent that I don't support it coming out of the general fund because I, I said if I can find four million dollars, it's going to mental health in Macomb County, not to, to a nature center. But I said if we can get out of the natural resource trust fund uh, and get our piece of the pie, absolutely. And I've conveyed that to the, the governor's office that uh, Macomb County. That's another area we don't get our share, and the trust fund would be a very appropriate place um, to fund. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, my township supervisor, Bob Cannon, uh, mentioned that he would like to talk a little bit about revenue sharing, so I'm just going to throw that at you, and I know that that's probably, you know, local uh, revenue sharing is obviously always important to our local governments here, and I, don't, I didn't hear any talk about that. I know there's so many big issues that it's uh, difficult to talk to all of them, but it's like at the fire department, when I worked with you, you could talk about all of them, so come on up. <laughs> that's, that's fine. I, I, well, I understand something. That, that I mean, I... Um, I came from local governments. I had 17 years on city council before I went to Lansing. So revenue sharing is a real priority for me. You know, and the one struggle that we have in Lansing is that because of term limits, people forget that there was promises made over the years. That statutory revenue sharing was sort of a promise that when cities, you know, they didn't want cities and villages and townships to have talk about so much. They wanted more <laughs> of the state to fund it and, and get away from property taxes. And so there was these promises made that, look, we'll give you statutory in lieu of, of this. And so I will tell you, unfortunately, a lot of people in Lansing don't come from local government, and I think sometimes they see it as charity. And uh, I mean, I, when I talk to people, they just don't feel committed to it. So I remind them of the fact that uh, you know we do have a, a duty to work with our colleagues in local government. Uh, but there's also plenty of unfunded mandates that happened. And for example, the veterans' property tax exemption, which which was a really great thing to do for disabled veterans, that's really a state benefit that uh, was paid for by local government. It's really for the state to pay. So I, you know, I'm working on that, trying, I think more and more people are starting to realize that really the state should be paying to reimbursing local government. Like I said, it, 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 you know, taking care of our veterans is a very important thing. But when it's a state benefit, the state should be paying for it. It, it shouldn't be you know, out of local government. So that's, you know, so we continue to fight those, those unfunded mandate pieces. They said it's just revenue sharing's gone up a little bit. It's just really hard sometimes when so many don't come from local government right. and don't appreciate. Uh, you know, one of the things I will tell you is that, uh, just to be brief, is, you know, sometimes elected officials think that there's this chain of command. You know, there's local, county, state, federal, and somehow as you move up the food chain, you're somehow better than the people you serve below. And I'm going to tell you, I came 17 years on city council. I'm doing the same job in Lansing that I was doing on city council, just more of it. Listening to constituents, resolving issues, trying to balance a budget, keep government running, being responsive. And it doesn't matter if you're a congressman or you're a senator, it doesn't matter. All of us are here equals. We've all been elected by the people to serve the people. And unfortunately, a lot of people in, the, in government have forgotten that. They think there's this chain of command. And unfortunately, with so many legislators, uh, even federal, never came out of local government, they don't understand how local government, I think, is really the most important portion of government because that's who provides the fire trucks, the police cars, the roads, the street lights, the things that every day people care about as opposed to you know, foreign aid. The average person is not worried about foreign aid. When they call 911, they want a fire truck to show up or a police car, and I think very often we forget that that's really the heart of what we do. Right. Sorry. That's all right. Thanks. And I, I agree with you on the local government side. I have two more comments, not questions. One is a, um, <laughs> that we are all for, uh, in case you're wondering about the county commissioners, we're all for four-year terms. So I'm hoping that the four-year term thing, uh, oh, uh, just a comment, it's not a question. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> Commissioner, I'd just like to follow up. I'm sure the, all the board members know that a lawsuit has been instituted against the state of Michigan by local communities mm -hmm. to look at well, exactly what we're talking about, Okay. local funding. So it might be out of the legislators, legislature's hands because it's going to be in the courts. 
and I imagine it's going to take a long time. But being a three-termer from Shelby Township on that board, I agree with Representative Yurik completely. I'd like money to go right to the local area where they know how to use it. And I think that mentality is in the legislature. We just have to turn that boat around and get it going back. Thank Great, you. Thanks. And Commissioner Churkin, after this meeting or sometime soon, can we talk a little bit about the 911 fees? Because some of the things you said don't match up with some of the information we got after. So I'd like to talk to you a little more about that, please. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. And uh, Commissioner Sager, I'm going to go first because I believe that you're going to um, end on a better note. I think you're. I think it is. Uh, appropriate since you started this that you'd be the one to have the last word. So if you don't mind, I'm going to... My comment is to stay tender. That's all I have. Left, so yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Um, okay. Um, just, a, just a... Yeah, yeah. Just a couple of things. First, um, this body knows um, as um, president of the Michigan Association of Counties our, when we got our transportation platform, it, it's... From our committee, it said that all all new revenue must go through Act 51. So I was able to get the um, Board of MAC to reject the entire platform based on that being in there and send it back to them. And then I did a conference call. They, the Transportation Committee held an emergency meeting. I know they just have a platform to lobby you guys, but I didn't want the Michigan Association of Counties to be taking that position. And, and uh, I explained um, um, close to uh, what uh, Representative Shannon and others have said, if, if we lose our businesses in the Metro Detroit area, you're going to lose your revenue in the outstate area. So, um, so we're doing our part as well. Um, and we all understand the Act 51 situation very clearly. Um, the, uh, with respect to local being, I served on a school board for six years and I served on a city council for eight years. Not only is it, to my opinion, more important and the tax dollars that are, uh, uh, that are levied at that level, you, the residents see more readily, um, but you've got the residents there on a regular basis in your face. It's a harder job. This job is easier than when I was, was when I was on city council and city council was actually easier than when I was on school board. So I agree with that a hundred percent. The, now we're not all going to agree with this, but the, the comment, why don't you guys levy a millage? One of my biggest beefs about everybody in Lansing is, is year after year after year, I've been watching bill after bill after bill to prohibit local units of government of. And every time I see a bill that says to prohibit local units of government of, I, I am immediately just tense up and I'm ready to let's fight this one. Um, it's the reason I'm so active in MAC. Those are the bills that I'm looking for. And now, because nobody can agree on revenue, all of a sudden, hey, here's something you can do, local units of government. We got a jail to replace. We've got our own things sitting on our shoulders on top of roads. And, and, and the legislature has, over the last several years, had the benefit of giving to give tax cuts, and that's a wonderful thing. But the result of that from my years at the local level is that we had to create authorities so that we can assess millages to get the money back after the tax cuts were given in Lansing. So this one, I, my personal opinion, this one is on Lansing to figure, to figure out rather than us to figure out. I have already had to hit the residents at a local level. This is why I'm letting Marv go after me. He's much, he's much more statesman-like than I am. So, um, um, so that's the final thing that I want to say about that, and I, and and that doesn't mean everybody else here agrees with me. I think there are uh, there are commissioners that would much rather let's do a roads thing, and 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 not a jail thing. It is more. It would be more popular um, to do a roads thing to do a jail thing, but I don't think we have a choice. With that, um, I lectured you guys almost as bad as John Shirk and. <laughs> lectured us and I don't mean it in a mere mean-spirited way 
I'm, I, when I say that, I am also speaking from what I hear and see from people serving at the le local level, so I appreciate you hearing me out on that. And I am going to let um, Commissioner Sager finish this out. Thank you. Well, you got to be long-winded. Uh, all, all I want to say to the state rep, senators, representatives, it was an honor and a privilege to have you all sitting here in the room with us. I was going to ask Paul Voino, who's a great friend of mine, and you can all put this in your head, how you can handle all these problems up in Lansing. I know we got them here in the county, but you got to be banging away back. What about this? What about that? And all I can say is good luck to you. It's a hell of a job you're doing, and I congratulate you for doing it as long as you've been, and best of health to all of you, and God bless you guys. Thank you. Hold on a second, guys. My computer wasn't working correctly. So I apologize to commissioners saying I'd let uh, Commissioner Sager, because I keep, I've been exiting and going back and names haven't been there. He's been watching. His has been different than mine. So I apologize. We have uh, Commissioner Leonetti and somebody's trying to get in on the second round over there. Commissioner Gillette, and we have Commissioner Kraft. Commissioner Leonetti. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just echoing, I really want to appreciate you coming here and speaking to us. I know you guys have busy schedules, too, so thanks for everybody who made the time to come out here. And, you know, it, it is a two-way street. You know, whatever we can do to help you, let us know. You know, when I see things that uh, Representative Sarabi is talking about with transparency, let me know. So when I go out in the community, I can let people know that. You know, when I hear about things that, uh, you know, you're, you're doing with respect to the auto reform, uh, you know, let me know so I can let people know what's going on in my community. When I hear things about what you're doing, Nate, let me know. So it's a two-way street. We're more than happy to uh, let our people know everything that you guys are doing. And on a final note, thank you for being bipartisan on behalf of Macomb County. We try to do that here. Uh, as a commission as well so thank you thank you madam chair thank you commissioner Kraft. thank you madam chair I want to thank you all for being here too I run into a lot of you in the hallways in Lansing so I get that exposure to all of you but the commissioners up here don't and I give them tidbits so having you all here is fantastic and I would be remiss if I didn't mention a lot of your work on CMH I know the last couple well last term we we received five million and then one million Rep Wozniak hasn't had to experience that yet, and I don't want him to. I would like a fix. I'm tired of getting millions of dollars brought back incrementally to our system. We've been hit. You all know that. We've, we've said that multiple times. And working with our new CEO, Dave Pankatai, who's hiding in the back, <coughs> if you have any questions, any concerns, if you don't understand anything, because it's a very complicated subject, please ask Dave, ask our board, ask the staff. We are here to help if you have questions for us. And if we have questions for you, I'd like to keep that communication open, whether it's through me, our CEO, board chair, whoever it may be, we're happy to work with you to help our citizens and, and the people that we help. Thank you all for being here. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. All right, Commissioner Gillette. Oh, I took my name down. Did you? Oh. Okay. <laughs> It just disappeared. It was there. I don't know if it's the cold, but this is slow. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner Gillette. I think that we should we should just take a minute to allow any legislators to leave before we move on because uh, um, uh, so why don't we take a few minutes, let people say goodbye to people, and, and thank you, everyone, for coming. Very much appreciated. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right, we're starting the meeting, so I did bang it. Well, I'm starting the meeting. Okay, so no, we're in the same meeting. Commissioners, take your seats. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, please sit down. Don't make me give you all a tardy. Yeah. Hey, my Texas comes out when I get mad too. You just wait and see. <laughs> I went to high school in Texas. Okay, so we're going to move on to um, um, presentation 6B, Macomb County Community Mental Health Update regarding Task Force and Finances. And how do you pronounce that last name? Pankatai. Pankatai. Got it. <laughs> 
Chief Executive Officer Pankatai. So we'll. Uh, oh, oh, wait. Before we do that, guys, I forgot to do. I didn't get a. I didn't get a receive and file. So a motion to receive and file, moved by Leonetti, supported by Romano. Please vote. That was on the other one. Yeah, I apologize for that. Okay, so that passes, and we're going to do a motion to receive and file on this. Moved by Kraft, supported by Lucido. <laughs> okay, okay, now you can go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, talk about a uh, tough act to follow. I didn't realize that one agenda item exactly what that involved, but um, the, the kind comments about the, the needs for the community mental health are greatly appreciated. Um, I was making notes and um, making my follow-up to-do list. Um, I was asked to come here this afternoon as a follow-up to the audit committee um, and then to give you some additional answer questions about our budget. Um, I do have um, excruciating detail about the CMH budget at the state level that I can leave a copy uh, for this group as well. So, that didn't work. Um, the, the first slide is just related to the audit findings. Um, we were here with the, the audit committee of the Board of Commissioners and the um, accountants from Plant Moran. Unfortunately, we've had at the Community Mental Health consecutive years of audit findings um, that were material. Mostly they were categorized as um, adjustments that were being made to our budget after the end of the, after the close of the fiscal year and it was taking way too long for us to finish that year-end closeout process. Um, the recommendations that Plant Moran made were to strengthen procedures to ensure that those, uh, that the problems were corrected in the general ledger and in the financial statements. We pointed out to them some of the factors are kind of just the system that we work in. The state, the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services, we do a quarterly reporting to them on a financial status report or FSR. Currently, we have not, and a number of the other PHP regions have not done the most recent uh, last quarter's report to the state because they keep changing the format and they haven't given us yet the final version of the format to report in. And it's nearing the end of September, which is the end of our um, fiscal year. So some of those are just outside of our control. The delays in receiving our Medicaid rates make it really hard to do our budget projections. I got our final Medicaid capitation rates this morning. Uh, we've already turned in our budget for next fiscal year. It's been approved by the CMH Board of Directors and it's gone through this body as well. So that's part of that delay. We are currently running those numbers against our utilization numbers from this fiscal year so we can um, see how it compares. Thankfully, it looks to be an increase. Um, but what we won't know until we actually run those numbers. And then we are also looking to get data about how we compare to the other regions in, a, in detail. So based on those audit findings, we've implemented a claims edit. We're requiring all of our providers to submit their claims to us within 60 days of that data service, or we simply don't pay that claim. Um, that's a very reasonable um, standard business practice. There was some hiccups when we first implemented it, but those are being smoothed out. Um, but that will allow for more timely financial reporting as well as more timely data projections going forward. As follow-up to our meeting with the Audit Committee, we are in discussion with uh, Plant Moran about s doing some consultation uh, to our finance department at the Community Mental Health 
Uh, we're working with Lisa. Um, so Cindy and Lisa are, are in conversation. Um, we are also working with our data vendor. I've mentioned a couple of times those the, the projections. For way too long, finance has just been looking backwards. And they've been looking backwards a long way because we didn't have a 60-day claims edit in place. So at the end of a fiscal year, we could get a claim from a provider from 10, 12 month, 10, 11 months back. And that was causing all those adjustments in our system. By tightening that up and by working with our data, we are we're mostly prior authorizing all of the community mental health services. So a person comes in, they get a, a individual plan of service. There's services that, uh, CMH services that are listed in there. We're authorizing those so we know the amount, scope, duration of those services for six months out. We can make projections based on those amounts and then start tracking our actual financials against those and we'll have a much better picture going forward. We also have a, a contract or an agreement in place uh, for Raymond. Um, that's the R-E-H-M-A-N-N -N spelling of Raymond. Uh, for Richard Carpenter, he's a subject matter expert regarding the PIHP finances. He's been the chief financial officer for more than one PIHP region. He currently chairs the financial, chief financial officer um, organization for the, the 10 PIHP regions. And he does, um, he's involved in a number, number of other counties. So he's gone through the transition process from an agency to a mental health authority and we'll be asking him to consult with the Mental Health Authority Task Force, but also as follow-up to the meeting we had with the Audit Committee, um, he'll be providing expert consultation to our Finance Department. Can I just clarify for commissioners, when he keeps saying Audit Committee, um, the Chair and Vice Chair of the um, Audit Committee, and were, were you there, um, and Commissioner Kraft, met with the auditors uh, and, and individuals from community mental health because of some concerns on um, some of the reconciliation and how they're reconciling in, in the timely manner and wanted to look into ways to look into that. So uh, because we didn't have a formal committee, not oh. everybody may be aware of that. He, that's what he means when he's re referring to audit committee is the group of us that, that met with him. Go ahead. Thank, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, so looking forward now, we are um, in the midst of the, the budget process at the state level. Governor Whitmer's budget for uh, next fiscal year includes uh, $211.4 million um, additional dollars for the community mental health or the PHP regions. There was an article in Cranes earlier this year that mentioned $150 million in underfunding to the state's community mental health system. The state has pretty much acknowledged that they've been underfunding us, which is, you know, a little too late, but um, it is nice, and they are making some moves to correct that. In addition, there was also a supplemental funding bill that got connected to the, the current budget, and that was an additional $49.8 million for this current fiscal year. It might have fallen off the radar, but that was moving through. The problem with that supplemental was they were looking to distribute that $50 million using the, the uh, financial model that was used for this fiscal year. That means Macomb would hardly get any of that. And that the counties or regions that actually had extra dollars that might be lapsing to the state would get extra money. So that really doesn't make a lot of sense. So if there is supplemental funding, we are asking that it, um, it be distributed in a different fashion and every little bit helps. Um, and we could use it this fiscal year. Um, I mentioned we're running the next year's uh, Medicaid capitation rates, so we'll have a better picture. 
If there's a significant adjustment to our budget, we will bring it back. The, the rate increases for the fiscal year 2020 um, are the best we've seen in five years. So Macomb has weathered significant cuts, tens of millions of dollars in Medicaid funding to our county. Um, we held off the, my predecessors in making significant reductions in services as long as they could, but that resulted in the reserves being depleted. And then the money was still not present, so those significant cuts had to be made. Um, I'm honestly glad that I was not here during that time. That must have been um, difficult for everybody involved, for, for the families and the people we support, for the providers, um, and for the staff. Just making those types of decisions are not anything that anybody would want to go through. Um, on the operation side now, we are moving to complete all of our hospital pre-screens face-to-face and with the goal of increasing our hospital diversions, which will decrease hospital use in general, which will result in financial savings. We can put those financial savings back into the community side, and our goal is to actually provide more services to more people um, using correct utilization measures. Um, I mentioned that on the one slide. We want to expand customer service. We are changing our website so it's more user friendly, be easier for people to find help when they need it. We are the first county in the state to pilot the open bed software. Um, we just met on, about that on Friday and it will help open beds. It was started primarily to find an inpatient psychiatric bed but it will help people get connected to all levels of service. And in summary, um, data analytics, utilization management. Our budget for next year did include a contribution to our reserve fund and that was before we got the current Medicaid capitation rates. So like I said, once we run those numbers, I'll be able to let everybody know how we see ending next fiscal year. So it's a lot of information. I have the, the detail from the, um, the Community Mental Health Association of Michigan and their analysis of the budget specific to CMH for next year. But hopefully I touched on the high points. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Brown. Thank you. What was the numbers you received this morning? Well, how are they in comparison to the last several years in terms of a trend? Well, I need to run the exact detail. At the state level, they were up two and three quarters of percent. And I mentioned it was 244 million statewide. There was also a five and three quarter percent increase specific to autism, and that was specific to the prevalence rates in autism. So they've already set um, a rate, a fee schedule for autism services. They did not take into account the growth factor in the, the number of people asking for those services. So there is an increase for next year. But that was just on that slice of the budget, just on that particular, how, how much is that gonna impact your budget with that? You said two and three quarter percent increase or three quarter percent increase? Um, Medicaid Behavioral Health and Healthy Michigan the Medicaid parts um, have a 2.75% actuarial rate increase. Okay. Um, the Medicaid rates, they're broken down by um, population type, and we have to run those capitation numbers against utilization to see how our um, total revenue, where we would project that to be for next year. I guess it's positive because it's, it's, it's positive, right? It's, it's, at least it's an increase. Um, yeah, there's every indication that it's, it's more than this year. All right. Um, the, uh, you said if there's any adjustments to your budget, you're going to bring it back. It's significant. What do you determine as significant? I, mean, what um, I leave that up to the accountant folks. But, um, yeah, I'm sure there's an exact number that would be significant. But I'm, ex I'm assuming the revenue increases would be material and we would 
make the appropriate adjustments. All right. Um, the the consultant you're bringing on is consulting with your with your finance department and the authority task force. Given what's happened, uh, has there been any change in the organization in the finance department? Uh, we've lost an accountant. She her Friday was her last day. Mm -hmm. um, so, how much is that? Uh, Richard Carpenter going to cost you? Um, his contract is for one full day a month on site oh. for three thousand dollars a month. Okay. All right. Uh, are you, is the community mental health still using living wage as a as a, as a requirement for contractors, or did they do away with that? I don't think that ever passed through. Okay. We are following the direct care wage increases okay. that are put forth by the state. Do you use a third-party administrator to help it, uh, manage your uh, your uh, your contract services? No, and unless why? you count Macomb County. What's that? We we use the Macomb County Financial Office and software to help get uh, pay the provider claims, uh, but the, nobody the, outside of Macomb County. Is there is that have been done elsewhere? I mean, maybe, maybe there's a. You've been in other systems. Is that the only way to do it? Or is there, is there, a, is there? A, we're familiar with third-party administrators, and um, we've got our own county stuff. But maybe our county is not quite up to par. But apparently, because things got so bad, maybe that's maybe that's part of the contribution to the problems you were having by not managing those uh, services properly. That's uh, it's it's an interesting question. I don't know. Um, I'm leaning towards that most of the other nine PIHPs, I think, do everything themselves. So you're operating in a bubble. You don't know what the possible. Anyway, it's interesting. Right. It's no, I, I, I mean, can I'm not follow a, up. I don't know. Yeah. I'm just curious. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank Good you. job. Good Com luck. Commissioner Kraft. Thank you, Madam Chair. Dave, can you update the Board of Commissioners on the status of the Authority Task Force and how we got to the point of looking at a contract for Richard? Yes, we've met, um, I believe our first meeting was in um, late June, and um, explored the pros and cons of becoming a mental health authority. And it gets difficult because the primary benefit to uh, the community mental health by becoming a mental health authority is that we could own property. That doesn't really resonate with a lot of people or uh, for people in the community. The, the goal is to be invisible if there was a change made that it would not impact the people we serve in any way. Uh, we had a consultant come down, Mike McCartan, from uh, St. Clair County. He had gone through the process twice with Genesee County and St. Clair County. Um, and they were successful in that nobody in the community noticed any differences. The primary change or impact is on the employees of uh, the county employees if they do change to become a mental health authority. And that's on their retirement benefits and their health insurance. So we had, uh, we did all the pros and cons. Then we had Mike come in and he told us the, the story of what he experienced. And then it got down to really the, the nitty gritty. So Steve Schmeagel um, is running some numbers about the pension plan and how there's no easy way to identify the community mental health staff who are participating or have participated in the pension plan. So they were trying to find that. Long story short, we're, we're down to the nitty gritty financial stuff about how, what, would become, what would moving to an authority, um, how would it impact the employees, Macomb County, and the new authority if one were to be formed by this body. So the group voted and said we need um, expert consultation and Richard comes with the highest recommendations um, as the subject matter expert in that area. 
And okay. Then, sorry, Madam Chair, if I may continue. No, continue. So we go through this whole process and then comes the question of who's going to pay for, for Richard's contract. And at the task force and at our CMH meeting, we discussed a triumvirate of buy-in from the Board of Commissioners, the Executive's Office, and CMH all chipping in to help fund this. And the Executive's Office has already denied that request in full as far as I'm understanding. So basically... They would not be able to contribute, yes, right. was the, the feedback. So a pending request, which is not an action item today but could be coming, would be for the Board to split 50-50 with CMH or if we come up with some other math on that one i just wanted to point that out to commissioners thank you dave thank you madam chair and you guys have already hired him though right we we have a completed letter of agreement okay. um that's going the county exec's office signed late last week it'll be going back to him we hope to have him on site still for september if okay possible. so it, it's it's going to land on probably on mine um in the near future all right Chair Smith. Thank you. Just to that point about the authority, I was under the understanding that for the county as a whole, going to an authority somewhat insulated the county in some certain situations from financial uh, uh, burden. Can you explain that in a nutshell? I can try. Um, right now, the, the a little nutshell. The contract with the, the state requires, uh, says that the community mental health is responsible for the first five percent of anything we go over a hundred percent of the first five percent and fifty percent of the second five percent using two hundred million dollars for easy math um, it would be a fifteen million worst case scenario um, if we were to overspend by um, twenty million dollars um, we are not and none of our projections indicate we would lose $20 million. Um, but that is how the, the risk reserves work under the current contract. Since our risk reserve on the community mental health side has been depleted, it's currently under 200,000. Um, it does change. I think it's a little higher right now. And we currently have about $4 million in unrestricted that we could um, cover those losses. As an authority, the risk would sit on my shoulders and the the authority's board of directors. We'll talk more about it. Thanks. It gives me a little idea, but thank you. Right. In layman's terms, if they end up with an authority, the county doesn't have the um, general liability. The liability that we have now. It changes. There is still the the general fund, but yeah, the the Medicaid dollars would be under the authority. Okay. That doesn't mean I have, I'm giving an opinion one way or another. By the way, I've received a few phone calls on this. Neither but am I. I I'm not I just, saying pro or okay. con. All right. Well, we'll be talking about uh, whether or not to, on my agenda, on the other, on the other issue with the 50-50. We'd appreciate anything okay. you could do. Thank I you. don't see any other speakers, so we have a motion to receive and file. Please vote. Otherwise, any questions? Huh? In the audience. You'll listen to that. Oh. But he hasn't indicated. No. Okay. No. no, it's, it's, it's 515 already. I know. 520. All right, so that motion passes 10 to 0. So the next item that we have is. Um, Ordinance 2019-03, September year-end funds budget appropriation ordinance. Oh, there you are, Steve Adair. <laughs> and uh, so I'm going to get a motion to recommend uh, to the full board. Moved by Romano. Support by Gillette. Oh, I'm sorry, Mark. Uh, <laughs> go ahead, Steve. Good evening, commissioners. The, uh, the ordinance in front of you today is something that we do every year. So what we do with our fiscal year funds, mainly grant funds in the county, but any, any year end uh, that's uh, in August or September, that's not a December like the rest of our calendar funds. So we come before you uh, about this time. 
uh, every September and ask you to continue their budgets uh, for the next three months or until a new budget ordinance is passed, which would then supersede uh, this ordinance in front of you today. It's, it's fairly routine. It's roughly 25% of their annual budgets and goes towards continuing operations until the budget is passed. Uh, are there any questions? Make a motion. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Gillette. So, uh, sorry, Steve, is this, uh, this is a requirement of the charter to do this? It's a requirement of uh, definitely, it might be of the charter, but definitely of state law as well. We need to be operating with a budget at all times under uh, PA2. Right. So we yeah. operate a budget at all times, but wouldn't our, I guess I'm just trying to figure out how this fits in the overall budgetary picture. I mean, we have a budget every year that we, appro we approve mm -hmm. and then it goes to the next year. So why do we have to have this little extra little adjustment thing? I understand. So the budget that you approved uh, last fall expires for the fiscal funds as of September 30. For the rest of the county, the calendar funds, they go through December 31st. So that you're operating without a budget unless you do this today, beginning October 1st, just for those fiscal funds. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Please vote. Motion passes 11 to 0. Item B, budget amendment finance indirect cost charges, 28,372,000. Steve Adair. <laughs> and uh, let me get a motion first. M moved by Duje, supported by Sager. Go ahead. Thank you again. The, uh, this item, of course, may, may uh, raise a few eyebrows because of the dollars mm -hmm. involved, uh, as you can imagine. This is what uh, we call in the uh, accounting world uh, sometimes uh, paper money, paper expenses. In other words, an expenditure that isn't actually going out the door, but rather just being used for managerial accounting uh, control over the budgetary process. So what an indirect cost would do for my finance department would, it, if you go to the attachments, um, the spreadsheet, is it would increase the amount of expenditures um, in the 2019 budget, if approved today, by $402,000. Now, what the $402,000 reflects that currently isn't in my finance budget is the cost of human resources related to my department. Every time there's a human resources issue or there's an opening and we need to do interviews, uh, those items, of course, cost uh, the county money. And right now those are being recorded, of course, and being expensed out of the human resources department. But the finance department, for lack of a better word, from, a, again, a managerial accounting standpoint, is getting a free ride. That's not being anywhere reflected in the cost of running a finance department. So the bottom line number you see for that cost is simply not including those very important items. IT is another great example. All the technology we have, everything you're seeing here, that doesn't get charged to the board office right now. It doesn't get charged to finance. Under uh, this model of budgeting that we're introducing in fiscal year 20, uh, we will now be showing all of those items for each department in the county. It's much more transparent and it gives you a much better look into the true cost of operating uh, the government. Of course, in order to do that, it's also nice to have comparable figures. So as you get the budget books next week, you're going to notice fiscal year 20. And if we don't do this today, fiscal year 19, way down here, about $28 million less, and you're going to say, what happened? <laughs> well, we want to have comparable numbers for you. And so that's why we're putting this in front of you today as an amendment to allow the, the board to consider a budget that's going to have an apples to apples comparison in it. Thank you. Commissioner Brown. Thank you. Um, the, we always hear complaints at budget time about the uh, this this line item in your budget because it just seems to be random. Many parts, it's just a random event so you guys can move the money around to balance the budget in areas where you need money from. Like planning, it, it increases a uh, 20, uh, how are certain departments selected for the increase? I guess is the same old question. Like sure. say planning, it looks like they're up 27.6, is that right? Am I reading that right? Um, 
to, to your uh, question, it looks yeah. like planning is up. It, it looks like at the last line on the service department section there. Yes. Planning's up a, a total on the far right column, five hundred and thirty nine thousand nine hundred dollars. Yeah. Um, to be clear, these numbers are coming from our cost allocation plan that's prepared annually by Maximus, our third party vendor that does cost allocation plans in accordance with uh, federal grant compliance standards. Um, and, and that's done. So there's for, a formula. Eric. Yeah, there's a yeah, there's an, a, a, a Method to the band this this is How, just the summary page But this is you're doing an adjustment though to the to the past. This is an a, this is an amendment, correct? This is an amendment to the fiscal year 19, the current so, year. So yeah. how did it? If you have a formula, how did how did the formula get out this far out of whack? That you need to do an adjustment like it now. So previously, uh, we have not recorded uh, indirect cost in the general fund. As you'll see indirect costs being applied to the grant funds, but not to the general fund. And that's because for financial reporting uh, standards purposes, not to get too much into the weeds, these are considered internal uh, charges. And so they're eliminated at year end. Of course, I could say I could be running the smallest village in Michigan, and I could put $50 million of charges in here and $50 million of revenues, and all of a sudden I'd have a $50 million organization. Well, so for what GAP says, generally accepted accounting principles, is these types of internal uh, charges get eliminated for reporting purposes at the end of each year. So our budget more closely mirrored GAP basis uh, in that regard and didn't include that in years past. What we want to do here is, again, show the true cost of government, make it apples to apples compared to our grant funds where we have been charging indirect costs in order to get grant reimbursements. And that's why you're seeing that uh, for the first time in 20 with the amendment here in 19 today. Why haven't we done that to date? We are counting, the West County has received high marks financially for our independent services about being the top counties financially managed and so forth and so on. Is this a new model that's come up? Why are we doing it now? And have, why haven't we done it in the past? Well, I can't necessarily speak to the history of why you haven't done it in the past. You're not may the have policymaker. Been a, you're just you're the soldier. But <laughs> may have been a, a myriad of reasons historically. But I can tell you the reason we're doing it now is for the additional transparency that uh, lends itself in having these numbers directly into the departments. And it, frankly, we'll put more um, more eyes on those figures to understand those charges and and maybe affect some uh, decisions down the road well, regarding central departments. I agree with it. I'm not disagreeing. I'm just curious as to why now and yeah, and, and to, to be very clear to your point on the high financial marks, uh, we've continued to get those and, and had those in the past because again, from a financial reporting standpoint, this wasn't an omission or an error. This is simply something that only happens internally. Once the CAFR comes out every year, the audit report, these numbers wouldn't be included in those final figures anyway. Okay. Thank you very much, Chair Smith. Thanks, Steve. Um, the other Steve mentioned, I think last time we were talking about this, that he was going to be coming to us with revenue adjustments. Do you know when that might be coming for, like, you know, uh, updated tax numbers and all of that? Uh, I know that's on the agenda internally. I, I know that will be coming to you before the end of the year. Okay, because I think it was supposed to be at this meeting that you had mentioned it at one oh. point. <laughs> well, I do not have that with me today. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, Commissioner Gillette. Thank you, Madam Chair. Steve, you, you kind of answered this with uh, Commissioner Brown's question, but mm -hmm. is, you know, being that this is being done apparently for the first time uh, to show these numbers this way and this change, uh, I, I anticipate it might be more of a challenge for me and maybe some other commissioners to compare previous year's numbers mm -hmm. to this year's numbers because they're not going to line up so well. And I think, I think you mentioned that part of doing this is to make it easier mm -hmm. for it to line up for us this way. I mean, I guess what and you may have addressed this, but wouldn't it just be easier to leave it how we've always done it, even though it's not as, um, you know, if it's, if it's not violating the generally accepted accounting practices, you know, wouldn't it just be easier for comparison continuality sake? I think there's a lot of examples of, of accounting practices that are kind of minimum versus may be beneficial to do maybe a little bit more than the minimum. This is one of those. I can also speak to the historical context uh, for you because I think, you know, when we think about the budget one pagers that we did last year, for example, um, I actually went back and retrospectively applied the indirect costs as they would have been. We've been doing cost allocation plans for many, many years, of course, to all of the years that you'll see in those. So you know, when you go back and look uh, at, at histories going back to 2012 on those, fi on those budget one pages, they will all reflect indirect costs now. Okay, so we will have a basis for making comparison. Yes. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. With that, please vote.
Motion passes 11 to 0. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Commissioners. Okay, so um, we have the we have correspondence, so it's a receive and file, but go ahead and come on up. Motion to receive so and file. Moved. Uh, moved by MyJack, support by Lucido. Um, the Treasurer's Office second quarter report, for those that are wondering what we just did, motion. Um, do you have anything you want to say? Or and, and actually, oh, I'm no, sorry. We're, we're, nope, I'm good. I'm just okay. make sure everybody. Okay, I don't see any speakers, so please vote. No, I think that. Patient young lady. Fair enough. All right. Great job. Should have beyond the way here. <laughs> Motion passes 11 to 0. Thank you and sorry. Oh, no, you're fine. <laughs> okay, new business. Does anyone have any new business? Okay, moving on. Public participation. Does anyone wish to be heard? Please step forward. State your name and um, city or township. Uh, my name is Tim Joy. Uh, I live at 40335 Craft Drive in Sterling Heights, and I'm a retired mental health service provider uh, here in Macomb County. Did it for over 30 years. Uh, worked very closely with Mr. Kinch on a lot of issues such as direct care wages and, and services in the county. Also, uh, I'm a board of directors member for McCrest in Macomb County that, uh, that helps the, the homeless individuals in Macomb get back to living in the community and, and uh, finding jobs and so forth. So I'm very active in the community and, and in Macomb County. But I'm here today to talk about mental health services and I'm here to talk about a non-monetary issue. And this issue is with Lara and I noticed that many of the representatives and senators today work with Lara. So hopefully you can communicate this to them since they've already departed for the day. Um, but Lara is rewriting the rules for licensed professional counselors in the state of Michigan. Uh, if you aren't familiar with that profession, they provide therapy uh, to individuals all over the state of Michigan, but particularly a lot of Medicaid recipients in the state and in this county. There's over 130,000 licensed professional counselors in the state that service over 15,000 individuals, many of them that are Medicaid recipients. For some reason, these rules that have been in effect for over 30 years, they've decided to rewrite, basically eliminate and rewrite the whole thing. And the problem with it is that they're redefining the scope of practice for licensed professional counselors. And their redefinition is not including the ability to diagnose. And if you eliminate the ability to diagnose, then you eliminate their ability to practice and to bill insurance. So for some reason, and no apparent reason that I can think of, um, they're trying to basically eliminate this profession for some reason. Um, and there is, a, the law rule is having a public hearing October 4th up in Lansing, and we're hoping to rally a lot of people to go up there and testify against these new rules. But also there is a House budget bill which I had the number with me, but I don't have, I think it's 4325 that is going through the legislature right now. It's already passed out of committee. And basically if that bill passes, it overrules these new rules, if you can believe that. So uh, there is a lot of activity, but these new rules that goes into effect, it'll probably go into effect very quickly in November. And that can eliminate a lot of services for mental health recipients here in Macomb County. So it is, it is very, very important, and that's why when I saw the representatives were going to be here today and, and I heard that mental health is a big issue and a big point of discussion today, uh, this is something that is very, very important and could really change how services are delivered to the most vulnerable people in the county. So hopefully you guys can look into that, and I'll be around if you have any questions, but it's the kind of thing where we need a lot of advocacy from the county and the mental health services to try to defeat these new rules. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Does anyone else wish to be heard? Seeing none, we'll close the public hearing. Motion to adjourn by Drillette, because I picked on them all day long, and supported by Duje. Please vote. Tuesday, uh, Wednesday, 2 o'clock. I'm not sure. Bob, we're adjourned.